Happy Friday, everyone. This is David Kwam at Denton's in Washington, D.C. Uh, you are joining our weekly webinar related to uh, hot topics regarding the coronavirus and COVID-19. Today, we'll be doing our regular policy update and then taking a look at legal questions pertinent uh, to COVID-19. Specifically today, we're going to be looking at the regulation of labeling and advertising claims uh, for products used to protect, uh, protect against the virus a very hot topic with an awful lot of people trying to both help and some trying to take advantage uh, of the situation. So we're gonna be covering a lot of ground today. We'll keep the policy discussion short and turn right to our panel in just a moment. Again, this is David Kwam. I'm part of the public policy team here at Denton's. Denton's is the world's largest law firm. We have offices in over 180 locations and 73 countries. That includes uh, offices and some of the hot spots around the world with regard to COVID-19 and its outbreak. Because of that, the firm has been on top of this issue for several weeks, uh, organizing to protect not only our people, but serve our clients and then really be part of a leadership, play a leadership role in the communities in which we live and serve. Uh, today's webinar, as with uh, the past several weeks, is part of an ongoing series to help our clients uh, and the public understand some of the pertinent issues uh, that have arisen because of this very unique situation. I'd encourage all of you, if you have not already, to um, please go to our website and our COVID-19 hub. We have up-to-date information, not only about what's happening in the United States, but around the world. Part of being the world's largest law firm gives us insights into many locations in, uh, internationally and a very unique perspective on how this is affecting marketplaces all around the globe. Let's go ahead to the next slide. One more. One more, please. For all of those of you on the call, I will give a brief policy update. Uh, this is a map that I think everybody knows well, uh, the outbreaks across the United States affecting all 50 states and almost every jurisdiction. As I was told today, there's only one spot on earth that's really not um, recording any uh, infections, and that's American Samoa, um, who really shed its borders early on, uh, kind of a remarkable state for the United States and one of our, um, one of our territories. In the U.S., uh, a couple of things that are happening that are of note. Number one, the Congress has returned and is quickly moving to discuss the next phase of both sustaining uh, the economy, helping with the recovery, but also starting to stimulate the economy to put people back to work. It is expected that possibly as early as next week, certainly within the next two weeks, the House will start considering a bill to help stimulate the economy and make sure that the economy does not get worse. Two large impacts of that or two large issues that we are tracking. One is aid to state and local governments. There's a lot of talk about nearly uh, anywhere from 800 billion to almost a trillion dollars going to state and local governments directly to help with revenue losses. As many of you may know, both the states and localities are on the front lines of responding to the pandemic. Um, the $150 billion that they've received already went out two weeks ago. That's really to help uh, swallow some of the costs of the, uh, the pandemic that were not accounted for in their budgets. But what you're hearing from governors and legislators today is that the revenue losses at the state and local level could be catastrophic as we move forward. States have to balance their budgets, and that means any revenue losses mean either having to find new revenues in the form of new taxes and fees or cutting expenses, which can mean layoffs. Both of those could make the economic situation and the recession worse. With over 33 million people already filed for unemployment, aid to state and local governments is gonna be a key part of this next bill. On the flip side, there's also talk about providing some sort of liability coverage for businesses um, that are reopening to protect against possible lawsuits uh, with regard to the spread of the virus remains to be seen if that will be done at the federal level, it'll be done at the state level, and to what extent that will be done. 
but both of those lines are being drawn as we move into phase four of the bill. Other key issues remain the small business um, packages, including the payroll protection program, which has been very popular, but may get some changes from Congress as it moves ahead and other relief, possibly even including uh, help for infrastructure long-term. A lot of talk about broadband uh, infrastructure and the need to help people access online, be able to do more remote work, and of course, provide aid to schools all the way from the K through 12 level and higher education. Here at Denton's, we understand that for everything that comes out of the federal government, the real response is happening at the state level. So we have provided a um, 50 state tracker that is looking at all executive orders, legislation and regulatory happenings in all 50 states. You can access that on our COVID-19 hub. We've also gone down to both the city and county level for the largest jurisdictions in each state because any business needs um, that's operating and looking at these programs needs to follow not just what's happening at the federal level, but the state level and locally to get a full picture on how you respond. If Denton's can ever be helpful to you uh, in trying to figure out and navigate those three levels of government, please let us know. Next slide, please. With that, I'm gonna to turn to our expert panel on a very hot topic. Um, and I'm going to turn to our partner out in Los Angeles, out in Los Angeles, Bob Shuda. Bob, it's all yours. Thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in battling COVID-19, we are all familiar with recommendations to clean and sanitize ourselves and our families and the surfaces that we contact and to maintain a healthy lifestyle and diet. These guidelines have created an urgent need for products like foods, drugs, medicines, cosmetics, cleaners, sanitizers, and disinfectants. It's natural for manufacturers and sellers of these products to want to claim that they are effective against COVID-19. As David alluded to in his introduction, it's also conceivable that there are those uh, who might wanna take advantage of this situation. Uh, the subject is indeed so cutting edge that it has its own Wikipedia page. Next slide, please. As always, protecting the public health requires access to effective products. At the same time, protecting the public health requires avoiding false or unsupported claims relating to those products. Today, we will focus briefly on three federal agencies and their rules for supporting and guarding against uh, unsupported claims that a product is effective against COVID-19. First, the United States Environmental Protection Agency regulates products like cleaners, sanitizers, and disinfectants that are pesticides under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act. Next, the United States Food and Drug Administration regulates products like foods, dietary supplements, drugs, medical devices, and cosmetics under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. And finally, the Federal Trade Commission regulates against false or misleading advertising under the Federal Trade Commission Act. Next slide, please. Let me please introduce your speakers today. I'm Bob Shuda. I'm in Denton's Environmental Group in Los Angeles. I've practiced environmental law before federal agencies for 25 years and in California for 20 years. I'm a former Coast Guard attorney. I'm also a legacy McKenna attorney from that firm's pesticides practice. I will speak about EPA policies on products claims related to COVID-19. I'm also joined today by two distinguished attorneys and friends who bring great expertise to the subject at hand. Tisha Shestapal is in Denton's Washington DC office. Tisha provides food and drug counseling to industries in the life sciences, healthcare, cannabis, food and dietary supplement and cosmetics areas. Tisha also represents clients in front of the United States Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services. Tisha will give you the FDA perspective. Sarah Carlson is in Denton's St. Louis office. Sarah represents clients in advertising and marketing, including before the Federal Trade Commission and the National Advertising Division. Sarah also counsels clients on advertising related to nutritional products, cosmetics, foods and beverages, cannabis products, 
and more. Sarah will discuss the Federal Trade Commission today. Next slide, please. And I will now start with the EPA. Next slide, please. The key starting point is that any cleaning or disinfecting product that is effective or that is accompanied by claims that it is effective in killing viruses or bacteria is an EPA regulated pesticide. EPA regulates substances that kill or mitigate against pests. FIFR defines pests to include microorganisms, viruses, and bacteria. But FIFR excludes viruses, bacteria, or microorganisms on or in humans or living animals. The result is that EPA regulates products like cleaners, but does not regulate products like human or animal drugs or medical devices. It is unlawful to sell a pesticide that is not registered with US EPA. The sale of a registered pesticide must include a label that is approved by the EPA. This means that all claims of effectiveness against any pest, including the virus that causes COVID-19, must be supported with data and approved. Next slide, please. The definition of pesticide includes products like those shown and described here. These products are regulated as pesticides under federal and state law in the United States. These pesticide products must be registered. The labeling and marketing claims that producers and retailers may make for these products are highly regulated, are very limited, must be supported by data, and must be approved. If a pesticide is not registered or if it makes claims that are not approved, the manufacturer, distributor, and the retailer of those products may be prosecuted by state and federal authorities for selling unregistered or misbranded pesticide products. Next slide, please. Many cleaning products already advertise their ability to, cure, to kill nearly all bacteria and viruses that cause disease, including prior coronaviruses like the strains that cause the common cold. The issue before us here is that the virus that causes COVID-19 is new. While many household cleaners are proven to work against known coronaviruses, they've never been tested against this specific virus. As a result, labeling claims cannot be made that directly state that a product is effective against COVID-19. Any producer or retailer making such a direct claim that would do so at the risk of a penalty for misbranding. Next slide, please. Help is on the way, however. EPA addresses our need to clean and disinfect against this new pandemic through policy directed at new or emerging, or emerging viruses. EPA has a coronavirus site shown here. The site, can, the site contains a list of products that is known as List N. Products on List N are registered pesticides and have been proven to kill viruses that are similar to or are harder to kill than COVID-19. The Center for Disease Control refers to these pesticides as approved by EPA for use in battling the pandemic. Next slide, please. With the COVID-19 crisis, CDC and EPA are eager to see the public use disinfectants to stop the virus and want to protect the public at the same time from false claims. The result is the list that I've just described at list N. In list N, EPA has compiled a list of products that can be used against COVID-19. The list contains approximately 400 products. These products have been shown to be effective against viruses that are harder to kill than the virus causing COVID-19. If a product is on list N, the product may claim effectiveness, or I'm sorry, the manufacturer may claim effectiveness against viruses that are similar to COVID-19 because of the past performance of the product. Next slide, please. If a product is on list N or is newly approved for inclusion on list N, a company may make off-label claims as specified in EPA's list N guidance. In this context, an example of an allowed claim would be, this product has demonstrated effectiveness against viruses similar to COVID-19. The policy guidance for list N contains more examples of the types of statements that are pre-approved. A company, however, cannot make these claims directly on the pesticides label. The company can make such claims on locations that are off-label. 
Some examples of locations where these claims can be made would be in the technical literature to healthcare facilities, uh, technical literature distributed to physicians, to nurses, and to public health officials. Next slide, please. Uh, on non-related websites, on consumer information services, and on social media sites. The important message here is that cleaners and disinfectants claiming to be effective against viruses are pesticides. A company cannot sell pesticides that are not registered. A registered pesticide should not make claims related to COVID-19 directly on its label. A company should not make such claims at all unless a product is listed on list N. Don't make claims without data and don't make unsupported claims. If you have data related to effectiveness uh, against coronavirus, apply for status on list N and follow the guidance for list N. Make any claims on approved off-label locations such as the ones I've just described and keep any claims consistent with the form of claims allowed on list N. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Tisha and Sarah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Sarah Carlson, and I will be presenting uh, information relative to the FTC and with my colleague Tisha, who will be discussing the FDA. Um, you know, as an initial matter, this webinar is called Regulation of Labeling and Advertising Claims for Products Used to Protect protect against COVID-19. But please note that the products that have received warning letters from the FTC and or the FDA do not have sufficient scientific support to suggest that they possibly could protect against COVID-19. And therein lies the problem. Next slide, please. Let's talk Jim Baker. On his website, he offered products labeled to contain silver, such as silver soul liquid, and said that these products were intended to mitigate, prevent, treat, diagnose, or cure COVID-19 in people. What were some of the claims you ask? Here's one. But this influenza that is now circling the globe, you're saying that silver solution would be effective? Well, let's say it hasn't been tested on the strain of the coronavirus, but it's been tested on other strains of the coronavirus and has been able to eliminate it within 12 hours. Totally eliminate it, kill it, deactivate it, or Silver solution has been proven to kill every pathogen it has ever been tested on and it can kill any of these known viruses. Or, so the virus like the coronavirus that we're talking about affects the lung tissue. So what you can do, you just put it straight in a nebulizer which then creates a stream and you breathe it in and it'll go directly into your lungs where the virus and any other, where that virus is and any other infection. So I can't see everybody on here, but you know, if we were live, I'd ask you, do you think that the FTC or the FDA bought these claims? And um, I think you would guess no, and that's right. Let's turn to the next slide, please. Go ahead and keep going and we'll see if we can get the next slide put up. Okay, uh, we will just keep on going. All right, the next slide would show you a picture of herbs, herbs herbal Amy's, and I'd tell you um, these were referred to as coronavirus protocol products. We've got tea, cell protection, tincture, um, immune system products. And what types of claims were these making? Well, they'd say things like coronavirus treatment. Stephen Buhner has analyzed how coronavirus infects tissues, what tissues they infect, and the herbs that are used to interrupt that process, as well as the herbs useful to shut down the cytokine cascade they create. Here is his protocol, or Stephen Buhner has used this with other coronavirus infections, including SARS, it works well. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Stephen Buhner, he's an herbalist and an author on herbal medicine. Did the FDC and FDA buy it? Again, no. Were you to look at the next slide, you would see a picture of, and probably some of you can't imagine what this looks like because I'd never seen one before, but a silicone, a sonic silicone facial brush. And what types of claims were made relative to that brush? Well, it was that face vital sonic silicone facial brush fights off coronavirus or ramp up your beauty and cleansing re regimen, fight off corona. Again, as you can tell, my punchline is going to be that the FTC did not buy it. So 
what are the FT, what's the FTC saying and what are the FTC and FDA jointly saying? They're telling us that we are to be wary of any claims that suggest that a product can cure or prevent COVID. Indeed, FTC warns, at this time, there certainly are no products you can buy online or services you can get at a neighborhood clinic that are proven to work. Agencies like the FTC and FDA are further warning that treatments and vaccines are in their early stages of development and have not been fully tested for safety and effectiveness. Please turn to slide 21. And with that, I'll hand the proverbial mic over to Tisha. Good morning, everyone. Um, so eventually we'll, the slides will catch up, but we're gonna talk now about what, so what actions have the FDA and FTC taken against these companies? Well, they've been pretty busy. Since early March, um, when all our lives changed, the FDA and FTC have been actively monitoring and enforcing against companies for selling these products that, as Sarah mentioned, were um, intended to prevent, treat, diagnose, mitigate, or cure COVID-19. As of yesterday, approximately 68 enforcement letters have been issued by the two agencies. For those of you, and we um, saw many of you, the attendees that you are in industries where you're familiar with these FDA warning letters, 68 enforcement letters in this short period of time is a lot. Um, about 38 of those letters have been joint letters. In fact, FDA just issued, FDA and FTC issued three joint letters yesterday. Um, throughout this week, we had to keep changing that number um, every few days. Um, I should note here that the agencies have overlapping jurisdiction in several areas, which is why um, some of the joint letters, well, whereas FDA regulates the labeling of over-the-counter or OTC products, drug products, as well as certain devices, cosmetics, food, et cetera, the FTC has jurisdiction over advertising. And when I say labeling, FDA defines that much more broadly than just the label that's on the package or on the item itself or the outer package. Um, in these letters, for those of you who are familiar, FDA and FTC typically allow at least 15 days for companies to respond. Here, the agencies have demanded much shorter response times, requiring companies to respond in only 48 hours um, with specific steps they've taken to correct violations, as well as the steps they plan on taking to prevent reoccurring violations, recurring violations. Next slide, please. I guess we're not caught up yet. This is a uh, slide 22, if, if we're able to get there. So the enforcement letters address products ranging from air purifiers and um, as Sarah mentioned, the sonic silicone face brush to a myriad of dietary supplements, including many different vitamins, as well as uh, IV therapies and ozone therapy. Um, next slide, please. This is slide 23. One more, please. So as I speak for the next few seconds, um, if you could advance through the next couple of slides. Um, for those of you who are interested in all the gory details um, here and in the next few slides, um, you can see the range of products that are covered by the warning letters. I mentioned a few of them already. Um, there are some subcategories of products that um, appear as frequent flyers on the list. Um, you'll, you'll see, I think I mentioned the ozone therapy and the stem cell therapy as well as products that were touting immune support, essential oils, CBD products, and colloidal silver products seem to be a favorite. Um, the, of note about some of the immune support products, oftentimes the claims were not direct, um, claiming a direct impact on the coronavirus itself, but making claims related to abuse, boosting of the immune system's ability to fight coronavirus. So falling into the prevention category. And with that, I turn it back over to Sarah. Okay, so you're asking now, what is a claim? What is a claim? Well, it can be expressed, it could be implied, it could be in the product name, it could be in your website name, it could be even in your meta tags. All of it matters. And what do you need to make a COVID-19 claim? Indeed, what do you need to make a health or safety claim in general? Um, when we talk, hopefully someday to talk about the advertising that you are doing, you are going to become so familiar with these five words that are about to roll off my tongue. To make a health or safety claim, 
including but not limited to a COVID claim, you need competent and reliable scientific evidence. And since I've been doing this now for over a decade, I expect you to then ask me, Sarah, what's competent and reliable scientific evidence? And I'm, unfortunately, I'll have to give you a mouthful in return. Um, it includes test analyses, research studies, or other evidence based upon the expertise of professionals in the relevant area that has been conducted and evaluated in an objective manner by persons qualified to do so using procedures generally accepted in the profession to yield accurate and reliable results. I say that the gold standard includes well-controlled human clinical studies. And if you look at the letters that have been circulated by the FTC and the FDA, those are the types of studies that could be necessary here. So can you turn to the next slide, please? I'll let you all read these quotes to yourself, but we can see a theme here, and that's basically don't sell products that say that they can cure COVID-19 because there is not competent and reliable scientific evidence to support those claims. And who is Andrew Smith, you ask? Where he, well, he's the director of the FTC's Bureau of Consumer Protection which stops unfair, deceptive, and fraudulent business practices by collecting complaints and conducting in investigations, suing companies and people that break the law, developing rules to maintain a fair marketplace, and educating consumers and businesses about their rights and responsibilities. We'll talk a little bit more about that, but right now I'll hand you back to Tisha. In the next slide. So from the FDA's perspective, the cited claims that were in the letters and that Sarah read to us in the beginning, um, as well as certain other claims that were not cited, render the products both unapproved new drugs as well as misbranded drugs. Uh, the, both of these, the selling of unapproved new drugs or misbranded drugs are both violations under the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act. So the FDA's hook here is that the definition of drug under the FDCA, or Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act, includes, and you can see here, articles intended for use in the, and this is a phrase you'll be familiar with as well, diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease, as well as articles other than food intended to affect the structure or function of the body. So the concept of intended use here is a really important one because of how it, it can affect how a product is regulated. I often give the example of a bottle of water. If you were to tell somebody that it's, you know, a refreshing beverage, it's a food. If you tell someone that they can, you know, prop their arm up on it after surgery and it will help the expedite the healing process, it becomes a medical device. If you tell them it will cure something, it becomes a drug. So intended use um, is, is very important and underlies um, all of, FDA's or a lot of FDA's regulatory framework. So the intended use can bring a product within the FDCA's definition of a drug, regardless of whether or not you're calling it a drug or a device or a dietary supplement. Um, the FDA defines this intended use as the objective intent of the person legally responsible for the labeling of the drugs. So the manufacturer, uh, typically. The intent is determined by personal expressions, or may be shown by the circumstances surrounding the distribution of the article. So this definition allows the FDA to cast the net widely, and it does that. Um, it's not limited to the product label, as I mentioned earlier, or the manufacturer's retail website. It can be as broad um, as statements made by the company's sales representatives, um, blogs that are affiliated with the company, tweets, Instagram posts, and other social media posts. In fact, the recently issued letters that the FDA um, and FTC issued did look at those, um, those websites. Next slide, please. So the FDA and FTC uh, stated their commitment to continued monitoring of companies. When the first round of letters was issued, the agency announced a cross-agency task force um, that would address complaints reported to the agencies and also work with major retailers to monitor their online marketplaces. Here are just a couple of quotes that have come from various press releases um, in conjunction with sort of the batches of letters that have been issued. Um, and it appears that the agencies have stayed true to their words. As we saw earlier, they've been quite busy in the last couple of months. 
After the initial round of letters, the agency has issued over 60 letters, as well as taking even more serious action in some cases, which we'll talk about in a few more slides. Just yesterday, the FDA provided an update on its efforts in the fight against fraudulent products. As part of what the agency called in its press release, Operation Quack Hack, the agency stated it has discovered hundreds of fraudulent products um, being sold with unsubstantiated claims, including drugs, testing kits, and what's now a familiar household term, PPE, or personal protective equipment, which includes face masks and gloves. Um, the FDA revealed in its uh, announcement yesterday that it's been working with online marketplaces, domain name registrars, payment processors, social media websites to remove and keep off of those sites fraudulent products. And, in, and it also stated that it has sent hundreds of abuse complaints to, uh, to its partners, domain name registrars, as well as internet marketplaces. Next slide, please. Now, onto a few examples where uh, FDA warning letters or FDA and FTC warning letters weren't enough. Um, on April 29th, uh, a federal court issued a temporary restraining order against Gordon Peterson individually, this is the first bullet here, and his companies, My Doctor Suggests and GP Silver, um, in response to a civil complaint alleging that Peterson and his companies conducted a scheme to defraud customers um, by promoting and selling silver products against uh, using fraudulent COVID-19 prevention and treatment claims. Interestingly here, the defendants weren't charged with the marketing and selling of unapproved and misbranded drugs, which is what is cited in all of the enforcement letters, but they were charged with mail and wire fraud. Here, the Consumer Protection Branch of the of DOJ's Civil Division worked in conjunction with FDA's Office of Criminal Investigations on this matter. And let's look at just one example of, a, of FTC litigation. The FTC filed a complaint to stop marching individually and also doing business as Holy Organics from disseminating false advertisement claims that Thrive, which is a pill with vitamin C and herbal extracts is scientifically proven to prevent or treat illnesses like COVID-19. Um, the federal court complaint states that beginning in or around March 2020, Ching started to market Thrive as a, quote, antiviral wellness booster, unquote, that treats, prevents, or reduces the risk of 2019, or COVID, sorry, COVID-19. Um, the complaint alleged that the defendant claimed Thrive boosts immunity to help protect people from getting COVID-19 and would treat the disease if they did get it. And important here, the complaint alleged that Ching falsely represented that the benefits of Thrive were clinically proven. Again, clinically proven, competent and reliable scientific evidence, at least as much evidence as you're stating in your advertisements. Um, but obviously the FTC said that there's no scientific evidence that Thrive or any of its individual ingredients could treat, pre prevent, or reduce the risk of COVID-19. The parties agreed to and the court entered a, pre a preliminary injunction without any admission of liability, stating that Ching cannot make any advertisements that Thrive treats, prevents, or reduces the risk of COVID-19. Tisha? So in Genesis 2, um, it, it, another federal court entered a temporary injunction against the Genesis 2 Church of Health and Healing and its four principles to stop the sale of its miracle mineral solution, which when combined with the accompanying activator it was sold with, creates essentially with a bleach product that consumers were encouraged to drink to treat coronavirus. Um, the church had previously received a warning letter um, from FDA a few, uh, I believe a week or so earlier, and the company had indicated to FDA and FTC um, that it was going to refuse to, to make any changes and to cease the sale of its products. So uh, FDA and F, um, FTC took it a step further. In uh, Marshall, the next um, US v. Marshall, the next case listed, just over a week ago, a naturopathic physician in Washington state was charged with a felony related to his attempts to promote a misbranded drug as a prevention for COVID-19. Here, um, according to the complaint, the case originated from consumer reports um, about Marshall's Facebook posts and complaints that were submitted to the FDA. 
In this matter, the FDA's Office of Criminal Investigations actually played an undercover role um, and inter interacted with Marshall, purchasing products um, and speaking with um, the defendant. Um, in this case, the defendant is a, is a recidivist. He has twice um, previously been convict convicted and sentenced uh, for distributing misbranded drugs, so apparently did not learn his lesson. That's unfortunate. Uh, so let's talk about state AGs and little FTC acts. Um, the, F, the big FTC act, the federal statute prohibits, among other offenses, unfair or deceptive acts or practices. And the majority of states have enacted their own, what I'll call little FTC acts, or you may have heard me call them mini UDAPs, unfair and deceptive trade practices statutes. Um, what these do is they can open up the door both to action from state attorney generals, attorney general, and private litigants. Uh, going back from whence we came to my first slide, Jim Baker, uh, the state of Missouri indeed filed a lawsuit against Baker by, through its AG and his production company to stop them from advertising or selling silver solution and related products as treatments for the coronavirus. Uh, this is only the beginning. As for class actions, well, one of my favorite topics, as many of you all know, there will be and there already are consumer fraud class actions alleging that product manufacturers misrepresented the product's level of protection against various viruses and bacteria. You know, there's currently a wave of hand sanitizer litigation. There's litigation about false vaccines. And there have been and there will be a lot more. This doesn't even take into account class action that's currently geared at, for example, price gouging. There will be waves of class action litigation for the future. Uh, can you please do the next slide? This is our for foreboding eyes are everywhere slide. Look, uh, the problem here, as I'm sure we all agree, is that by claiming products treat COVID-19, these advertisers or manufacturers or companies may delay or prevent people from seeking the only appropriate supportive care right now. So agencies like the FDA and FTC are encouraging consumers to file complaints, to report when they see these types of advertisements. There is no cure is what they're saying and they're inviting us to come report. With that, I'm going to hand uh, the mic back to Bob and the next slide. Uh, thank you, Sarah and Tisha. Very good. Um, uh, we, we've got some time to take some questions. You can also uh, contact us um, offline if you'd like, everybody. Um, if you have a question, um, go ahead and type it out in the chat room and uh, we'll take it here. Um, while uh, you're thinking about your questions, um, let me just conclude um, by saying we wanted to thank you all for your interest this morning reminding you that we're able to help in this area and uh, ask you to please contact us for any of your needs. And we'd like also to um, remind everybody to be safe, healthy, and productive as we uh, continue in this situation. Um, I see no questions. Uh, so let me send this back to David for a final word. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tisha and Sarah. Fantastic job on a, uh, really cutting edge area that's going to be with us for quite a while. So thank you um, for all of that. Let's see, I do, have, uh, there is uh, one question that did pop up, Bob. Um, so what, and uh, so what can a new approach that disaffects uh, claim, what can it claim initially if it's a modification of a current approved approach? Bob, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I, I would, I would consider that to be, um, uh, a, a, a modification of a current approved approach would, uh, I think it would require a, a label amendment to, um, to, to EPA. Um, but again, we're in a situation where uh, we've got a, 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 we're comparing uh, current products to use against prior known uses. Um, I think we'd need to look specifically at the list and guidance and follow that directly. Um, I would not go ahead and change your, um, your claim uh, until that claim is either approved by a re-registration or an amendment to a label um, or uh, without, without going through the list and process. 
Super, thank you. Well, barring any other questions, and with it being Friday, I want to thank all of our, um, everybody in attendance for joining us this Friday. We'll be doing this again next Friday um, at 11 o'clock, and we'll continue this throughout the crisis. As always, if uh, those of us here, either any of our speakers or anyone at Denton's can be of service to you, please feel free to contact any one of the speakers or myself, David Quam, and we would be more than happy uh, to help you or direct you uh, to the expert that we have within the firm. Everybody be safe, be healthy, have a great Mother's Day weekend, and to all the mothers out there, thank you for all that you do. Um, we are out this Friday. Have a good weekend.